its flagship show having Slayer in the title, it's no surprise that this universe has a deluge of daring destruction of demons. Hello, geeks, freaks, and all those unique. This is MC Frodus. There are so many things that can be noted about Buffy the Vampire Slayer and Angel. I would say it's because the shows are filled with complex plots and characters, which is true, but honestly, it's probably because I can recite both shows pretty much verbatim at this point due to watching them incessantly during my teens and 20s. With Sarah Michelle Gellar recently talking about how she wants the legacy of Buffy as a show to remain intact, despite her feelings about the creator of said program, I wanted to take a look back at one of the most creative aspects of the show. With over 250 episodes between both shows, the writers had to come up with creative kills. While Giles might have said slaying should be plunge and move on, plunge and move on, if that were the case, it would have gotten pretty boring after a while. So this is my top 10 list of the greatest slays in the Buffyverse. First, an honorable mention to the absolute slayage of Joss Whedon's career by Ray Fisher, Charisma Carpenter, Amber Benson, Michelle Trachtenberg, and others. As I said in my video about the fall of Joss Whedon, while I've made my peace with continuing to enjoy both of these shows, absolutely fuck that guy. But now, let's look at the times the Buffyverse killed it with the killings. Number 10, Xander Takes a Stand. The Zeppo serves as one of Xander's finest moments in Buffy the Vampire Slayer, which we've got to admit he didn't get many. Yeah. I'm always going to take the opportunity to dunk on Xander, that self-righteous, nice guy self-insert for Whedon. But this isn't about that. Xander is stuck on the outside of the group while his friends are trying to stop the opening of the Hellmouth. While he's put down by Cordelia, he's low enough that he tries to boost his self-esteem by getting a car. In a series of bad choices, he ends up fighting against a group of basically hick zombies. The interesting thing about this particular death is that most people forget what actually happened to the leader, Jack. I have to admit that I myself, when initially writing this list, chalked it up to Xander's confrontation with him. When Jack plans to blow up Sunnydale High School, Xander squares off against him. When faced with the concept of absolute oblivion, Jack backs down and de-arms the bomb. Xander proves several times that he's able to talk himself into victory. This one might be the best one. While the Yellow Crayon story is certainly the most famous, I think this one is even more effective. It doesn't rely on what is essentially emotional blackmail, plus a dose of good magic from some de ex machina witch's coven. It is all from Xander, essentially playing verbal poker against his opponent. And just as Xander is letting Jack walk away, he gets mauled and eaten by a werewolf Oz. It's an unexpected moment and certainly one of the most unusual on this list. But still, I think worthy of a mention due to the buildup. 9. Angelus uses the beast against himself. While the behind the scenes strife of Angel Season 4 have certainly put a damper on things, I'm still very much a staunch defender of most of the storytelling that happened during the season. As far as I'm concerned, it plays out like a tragic opera. One of the most interesting elements of the season was the character of the Beast, as he's probably one of the most powerful little bads that have ever been in Buffy. A seemingly nigh-unkillable demon, he blots out the sun in Los Angeles and absolutely massacres the lawyers of Wolfram and Hart. He's such a force to be reckoned with that the good guys need to bring out Angelus for blah 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 plot. Like I said, I can defend most of the storytelling, not all of it. I also can't defend that. But in bringing out Angelus, an extremely dangerous piece is placed on the playing board, and he doesn't fool around. While he might not be the strongest, he is one of the most dangerous creatures in the entirety of the Buffyverse. He is calculating and willing to do anything to be in control. He is an agent of chaos, but only as long as he is the one bringing the chaos. He is able to use his intellect to put himself in charge. He does this in Salvage when he allows the Beast to pummel Faith to subdue her. Once he's satisfied that he can defeat Faith on his own now, he has no more use of the Beast and uses the knife the Beast made for his master against him, realizing the only thing that can defeat a creature as strong as the Beast is a part of himself. After the Beast causes so much death and destruction through the first half of Season 4, there is a sense of catharsis upon his demise even if it led to some more Angelus bullshit. 
Number eight, bored now. This particular killing is unique and that it's the only one on the list that is defined as murder. Every other death is for the greater good. While Warren Mears is an unrepentantly evil character who has murdered Tara, his former girlfriend Katrina, almost fatally shot Buffy, and caused an incredible amount of strife for the Scoobies over the season, there is a different tenor in his death from any of the others. This is probably because he's the only human on the list. The Buffyverse has always placed a premium on being human. Demons can be killed, but humans require human justice. But a grief-stricken Willow hopped up on dark magics wasn't going to settle for that. In the wake of Tara's death, Willow goes insane with vengeance, attacking Warren. He tries to fend her off with technology and spells, but she's basically the Terminator. It's brutal to see one of our heroes fall so hard to the dark side. But you got to admit, Dark Willow had style. She ties Warren up, torches him psychologically with images of his first victim, drives the very bullet he shot into Buffy into his chest, and sews his mouth shut before flaying him and emulating him. It is the darkest death in Buffy, but my god, it was so absolutely memorable for the sheer over-the-topness. It's also hard not to cheer for the death of such a repugnant character as Warren. Number seven, Illyria takes her best shot. The finales in the Buffyverse have always had some pretty impressive kills in them, especially the series finales. The battle of good versus evil is just amped up to its highest levels. It has to be spectacular. When you throw in a primordial demon king, yeah, you're going to get something pretty cool. While we've had Fred since season two of Angel, it was only in season five that we got Illyria, the old one who took over Fred's body. The ancient demon lord had powers that outstripped anyone we had seen before, still being incredibly impressive even after her powers were drained by the Mutari generator. She was an important part of Angel's plan to take down the Circle of the Black Thorn. While we don't see her take down Azuriel the Devil, just the small head tilt we do see lets us know that the battle means absolutely nothing to her and is just a petty inconvenience. But what we're here talking about is Sivis Vale. The magician in the circle, Vale is considered one of the strongest demon sorcerers in Los Angeles. He is even the one who gave Connor his false memories. Wesley is sent to fight against him and sadly loses his life in the attempt. When Illyria finds him dying, she transforms back into Fred to allow him peace in his death. Overconfident, Sivis Vale looks at the visage of the frail Fred and tells her to take her best shot. Illyria rises, transforms back into her demonic form, putting her fist through Vale's face. The emotional roller coaster of Wesley's tender death and Illyria's destruction of Vale is needed together to really drive both moments home. We're devastated by the loss of Wesley, but receive some catharsis in Illyria killing his murderer. Number six, Buffy may be dead, but she's still pretty. As you can tell, I really like this moment. As it was unknown if Buffy would continue on past its first season, this episode was written as a potential series finale, and the epicness of the death speaks to that. Prophecy Girl was the culmination of a dozen episodes that had come before it, with Buffy finally confronting the master. Decked in Buffy's most iconic outfit, her spring formal gown and leather jacket, she drowns in her confrontation with the master and he's released. But she's revived by Xander and goes to the school in order to stop the opening of the Hellmouth. There is a cinematic finality in this battle. The Scooby gang are in the library, fighting together to beat back the Hellmouth. But they are quickly losing against the massive creature as it's emerging. But the real battle is above on the roof. As the master watches in glee, Buffy approaches. He's shocked to see her there, and she says the iconic line, I may be dead, but I'm still pretty, in all of her hero shot glory. Buffy faces against the master, not falling for the same tricks she did before. She grabs him by the throat and throws him through the skylight down into the library, where the master is impaled on part of a broken table. He received the, the most epic of dustings, his body disintegrating and leaving behind nothing but his skeleton. Buffy has some huge big bads over the course of the series, but there's something to be said about the first one. The master is forever memorable, especially because he is the one who causes Buffy's first death. And his own death was just incredible. Number five, all their powers combined. 
being created in an unholy mix of science and magic with the backing of the military behind him, Adam was always going to be difficult to defeat. Buffy couldn't possibly do it alone. Not to be deterred by this small little problem, Buffy and the rest of the Scooby gang performs an ancient ritual to imbue Buffy with Giles' mind, Willow's spirit, and Xander's heart. This made Buffy the Uber Slayer, and Adam didn't see what was coming. While the Initiative fought against the many demons released into the Initiative compound, the combination Buffy faced Adam. This makes perfect sense, as Adam is being created through the combination of an Initiative soldier, technology, and a variety of demons. The fight starts like every other with Buffy, but once the spell kicks in, there becomes something special. The sight of Buffy, eyes golden, turning a missile into doves, is spectacular. Then she reaches into Adam's chest and tears his uranium core out of him, making it fold in on itself. One of the biggest criticisms of season four is that the cast spent so much time apart. This finale in the main arc drives home the fact that it was an intentional decision on the part of the writers to have the main characters grow and change over the season, but then realize in the end that they're stronger together. It's the only way for them to defeat their current foe, and they'll be closer than ever going forward. Number four, the one good thing they ever did. There is no other character who could have made this list three times. Each one of Darla's deaths is an iconic moment. From Darla's surprise Angel, after she's been stabbed by an arrow, to Angel being restrained while Darla is forced to feed from Drusilla. Finally, to this moment. This is a death that's unique on this list. While others are in the heat of battle, this death is a tender self-sacrifice in the middle of the rain. But as Darla's a monster in the Buffyverse who dies, it still counts. Darla went on an incredibly complex character journey. From a crony of the master, to a woman struggling with her sins when she returns to humanity. While she returns to form pretty quickly when she becomes a vampire again, this begins to change when she's pregnant. At first wanting to get rid of the baby, she slowly begins to love the child growing inside of her, being affected by his soul. Darla's death is so heartbreakingly beautiful as she lies in the alley behind Caritas, holding Angel's hand. She knows there's no way for the child to be born while she's still alive. She tells Angel that the baby is the only good thing that they've ever done together. She then stabs herself through the heart with a stake, leaving her crying son to be picked up by his father. I've never made a secret, my love of Connor. And this is the moment that starts it all, where Darla sacrifices herself so he can come into being. It is a tender moment to self-sacrifice that closes the book on a deep and complex character arc. Number three, close your eyes. Just to continue the trend of heartbreak, this is a great example as it combines that with an amazing fight of good versus evil. The battle between Buffy and Angelus was inevitable and highly anticipated. They were well-matched in terms of strength and skill, but there was always the emotional component to it. Buffy might hold back, while Angelus definitely wouldn't. There is such a volley in action leading up to this moment. Willow is trying to cast the spell to re-insult Angel. Kathla is awakening, while Buffy and Angelus fight against one another. The tension amps up until Buffy is in the corner, and it's in that amazing moment where Angelus is taunting her, telling her, what do you have left? And Buffy says, me. We start to cheer on Buffy as she takes the upper hand, but then everything jolts to a stop as Angelus's eyes glow, and we go through everything Buffy does. The relief that Angel has a soul back. But then we realize that it's too late. Angel has to be sacrificed. And our heart drops. I wasn't even a fan of Angel's at the time, and I still felt this deep sense of hurt because Buffy hurt. She kisses him tenderly and tells him to close his eyes. In his confusion, it's unlikely Angel even knew what was going on. This moment is also on the list of the most heartbreaking Buffy moments, probably another video I'll end up doing, but that doesn't change how epic this slay is in the history of the Buffyverse. Number two, Buffy's bigger boat. There was no bigger change in Buffy than the shift from high school into the real world. Therefore, it's also no surprise that this particular slay should be so epically over the top. Buffy is not someone who can just graduate without an event. High school has to go out with a bang. The mayor was a threat that had been building over the course of two seasons, since he was mentioned by Snyder and Schoolhard. 
When we finally get to see him, he was the jovial paternal figure, who also just happens to be pure evil. Slowly over the course of season three, he becomes more dangerous, gaining power through his rituals, and finally gaining a slayer as a daughter figure in Faith. Eventually, Buffy finds out what he plans to do, become the embodiment of the Old One Olvacon. The mayor, as Xander says, just wants to be a giant snake. In the previous episode, Buffy found out everything she did during high school wasn't ignored or forgotten. Her fellow students noticed everything she did, and they're willing to help out in one of the most difficult battles she ever faces. Buffy's part is deceptively small. She doesn't fight Olvacon. She speaks to him. Like Xander and the Zeppo, this is a psychological destruction. Buffy and her taunts about Faith are the bait leading Olvacon into the trap. This slay is so important to the course of the show. Not only does Buffy kill an old one, one of the demon gods, she blows up Sunnydale High School, the location that has caused her so much misery over the past three seasons. It says clearly to the audience that nothing's ever going to be the same again. It's not enough that Buffy just graduate. She's got to destroy the place and get the crew banned from ever filming in Torrance, California ever again. To quote the mayor, well, gosh. And number one. That was then. This is now. It's Buffy with a freaking rocket launcher. How could it not be number one? Buffy season one and the beginning of season two was mostly focused on vampires with the occasional monster thrown in. But the judge was one of the first demons Buffy faced. Not only that, he is said to be unkillable, only being able to be defeated by being dismembered, with his still living body parts placed in enchanted boxes. The judge's powers were terrifying, able to burn the humanity out of a person, turning them into ash. This was a raising of the stakes that was needed for the show, ushering in the darker turn the show was taking with the introduction of Angelus as the main antagonist. This slay takes the top spot because no one saw it coming. It's so outside of the box. In every urban fantasy that's come out, fans have asked, why don't you just shoot him? Buffy doesn't. But she goes the extra mile, using a freaking rocket launcher to blow up the judge. Just everything about it works. Buffy doesn't need to have a big fight with the judge. She's still emotionally reeling from Angelus. Instead, she just stands in front of the judge and in one of her most iconic power shots on the show, gives a quip and then blows him away. Most of the time with the deaths in the Buffyverse, it's not the death itself that actually becomes the iconic moment. It's everything that surrounds it. It's the emotions and the character arcs of our heroes. Some of these deaths are filled with tragedy, others triumph. But in the end, all of them stand out from the others as iconic moments. So tell me what you think was the best play in the Buffyverse. Comment down below. If you like my videos, subscribe to my channel. We are so close to my next goal. I do videos about Buffy, Doctor Who, Marvel, Star Trek, Star Wars, and lots of other geeky things. Be sure to catch the daily short series, The Headcanon Minute. Saturday is Slayer Day. If you want to support me, please visit my Patreon. You can also buy me a coffee, or you can go to my Redbubble and TeePublic to buy my geeky graphic designs. You can find me on all those platforms, as well as most social media, as MC Frodus. So until next time, live long, and may the Force be with you.